everyone and welcome to Chapter Book Storytime Variety Pack. My name is Ellen and today I'm coming to you from the beautiful Oakland Branch Library where I work. I've got two great books to share with you today. One is new to EVPL and the other one is an older book that I love to read aloud. So sit back, get comfortable. If you'd like to have drawing paper, crayons, coloring books, whatever, to keep your hands busy while you listen to the book, that's fine with me. You can stop the video, go get them, and then come back and start it again. Otherwise, we'll get started. The first book I'm going to share with you is the new book, the one that's new to EVPL. This is called Super Secret Super Spies, The Mystery of the All-Seeing Eye by Max Mason. I think this is a start of a brand new series, and I think it's going to be one you'll want to take a look at if you like action and adventure. Let's read the book jacket and see what's going on. Maddie Robinson is used to being overlooked by her parents, who disappeared, by her friends, who are non-existent, and even the science fair judges, who think she has so much potential. So when a mysterious man called the Recruiter invites her to join a society of super secret super spies, Maddie is shocked. But what she discovers next is even more surprising. The super secret super spies are actually the Illuminati, the world's most secretive organization rumored to control, well, everything. And one more thing, the, the Illuminati are kids Together, they are charged with protecting humanity from anyone who threatens its peace and basically keeping the planet spinning on its axis. No biggie, right? Enter the world of super secret super spies with all its gadgets, secret codes, and clandestine adventures in this first book by debut author Max Mason. So this is his first novel and the first book in the series. It's the gadgets that Maddie is interested in. She's an inventor. In fact, she's discovered by the recruiter at a science fair where she's showing off her latest invention, a cell phone charger that can draw power from other sources from a long distance away. The recruiter is very impressed and later he shows up at her house asking her sister and brother-in-law with whom she lives now that her parents are gone, if she would like to join a camp, a special camp, Camp Minerva, for gifted and talented students just like Maddie. Maddie is stunned. She's never been noticed before, as the book jacket said. She's no one has ever recognized her talent before. And so he has pamphlets. He describes the camp to her sister. And within minutes, the sister has signed all the papers. On the way to camp, she finds out that it really isn't a summer camp at all. It's Camp Minerva, part of the Illuminati, and she will be trained to be a super secret super spy. She's not going to a camp in the middle of Ohio. She's going to a tropical island where she meets all kinds of friends, people who are just like her, kind of nerdy, kind of interested in certain things and all having their own special talent or gift. For example, there's Lexi, who's very athletic and very strong. And then there's Caleb, who has great powers of deductive reasoning, just like Sherlock Holmes. Very good if you're going to be solving some mysteries, I would think. All of the recruits are there for training. Let's find out what some of the things that they have to do in their exercises. This is chapter 11. The next two weeks went by in a blur of hands-on training sessions, lectures on secret knowledge, and surprise off-island excursions. You cannot learn how to escape from quicksand unless you are dropped in quicksand, Volkov told them during a trip to the Brazilian rainforest. Volkov is an overseer of all the student recruits. She's the one responsible for their training. Maddie thinks that Volkov doesn't like her very much. You can see in this chapter if it's true or not. Enjoying some rare downtime, Maddie, Lexi, and Caleb relaxed at a picnic table near the camp's lake, which was also the site of their next session with Volkov. Maddie was using her phone's 3D software to draw a mock-up of a hoverbike. Caleb was teaching himself ancient Greek and Lexi was challenging herself to a push-up contest. Maddie looked up at the clouds. She was sure her parents would be proud of her for making it this far. Heck, she was pretty darn proud of herself. Lexi must have caught her looking at the sky. What are you thinking about, Maddie? Maddie normally might have told her a white lie, but she trusted Lexi and Caleb. My parents, she said. 
What are they like? asked Caleb. Oh, they're brave, said Maddie, and smart. They're scientists, too. Her gaze shifted to the ground, but they're gone, missing, somewhere in the North Pole. I'm so sorry, Lexi whispered. I guess I'm lucky to have both my parents, said Caleb. Not that I see them very often. Are they like world famous detectives, guessed Maddie. Caleb shook his head. Oh, no, no, my father's a diplomat. I was born in St. Louis, but he's always traveling to some far off place. I have to go with him. That sounds fun, said Maddie. Caleb shook his head. I've been to six schools in four years on three continents. Not an easy way to make friends. Well, you've got friends now, Maddie said. You just had to join the Illuminati to find anyone cool enough, she added, grinning and gest gesturing to herself and Lexi. Caleb, Caleb laughed. Yeah, I guess so. You don't have any brothers or sisters, either of you? Asked Lexi, concerned. I don't know what I'd do without my brothers. I've got four older ones. So you're the youngest of five, asked Caleb. Nope, replied Lexi. I've also got four younger brothers. Maddie tried to imagine having a family that big and shook her head. Are they all as tough as you, she asked. No, Lexi said sadly. They're way tougher. I can never lift up to those guys. I bet by the end of the summer, you'll be the toughest one, Maddie says. And besides, I definitely need someone as tough as you to help me get through training. Before Lexi could reply, they heard Killian come over a hill with Volkov and knew their next session was about to start. Killian is one of the other trainees. Excellent work on your marksmanship exam, Recruit Horn, Volkov said to Killian. Well, your teaching has been exemplary, Grand Sentinel Volkov, Killian replied. Lexi rolled her eyes. <sighs> the rest of Maddie's training squad arrived, as did tuck spots carrying scuba suits. Recruits, said Volkov, gesturing to Camp Minerva's Lake. Welcome to Narcissus Lake. This is not just a spot for calm reflection. It is also the world's deepest man-made dive pool at 115 feet. Killian went pale. This is the dive pool? Oh, come on, we've all heard rumors. There are piranhas in there. Maddie and the other recruits nodded. They'd heard the same rumors. Volkov went on. The real danger would be to succumb to your fear. Now, watch me carefully, she said as she demonstrated how to put on the scuba gear and attach their air tanks. If you do this wrong, she warned, do not count on me to save you. And she looked Maddie right in the eye. When they were all suited up, Volkov pointed to the pool. Dive until you see the device, she commanded. As Maddie prepared to jump in with her team, she noticed something off, way off. My tank is only 10% full, she yelled to Volkov, who smirked. They all are, Volkov explained. The harder you breathe, the faster you'll use your tank up. Maddie stood frozen. Best to stay calm, now dive and Maddie jumped in. It sort of felt like floating. As her unit slowly descended, the lake got narrower and narrower. Maddie did her best to control her breathing, but as they went deeper, the light from the outside grew weaker and the lake narrowed further into a man-made tunnel. They went down slowly. What are we looking for exactly? Maddie asked herself. They continued to descend until it was as dark above them as it was below. They flipped on their headlight lamps, but could still only see a few inches in front of them. Maddie still had 8% oxygen left in her tank, but she wasn't sure how long she'd be down there. Part of her wanted to float back up on the top right then, but she didn't want to leave without finding the device Volkov had mentioned. And then she saw it. At the very bottom of the pool was a pedestal with lines of red light zigzagging across the surface. The other recruits were wary, but Maddie swam over and touched it. The red zigzag shot over to her hand, creating an outline of her palm that blinked red. Just then a hidden roof, 115 feet above them, slid over the top of the lake, trapping Maddie and her entire squad underwater in near total darkness. Killian, breathing heavily, swam over to the pedestal, poking and prodding the device. They had no way to communicate, but Killian's glare showed his fear and his anger at Maddie as if she somehow caused their situation. 
Maddie did her best to assess the device. Maybe it's a palm print ID reader, she thought, but she put her palm on the device again and nothing happened. She looked at her regulator and saw that she only had 5% left in her tank. Suddenly, Safu and Raleigh swam toward her, or rather past her. Maddie saw what they were trying to escape from, but it was too late. A swarm of giant piranhas with freakish human teeth suddenly rushed toward Maddie, enveloping her completely. Maddie kicked hard to shake them off, but this only seemed to make it harder to get free. She was trapped. Then Maddie felt something grab her back. She turned her head. It was Killian ripping off her oxygen tank. Maddie's eyes widened as Killian's gleamed with greed. He reached for her mouth, and Maddie only had time to take one more big gulp of air before the respirator was tugged away from her. She lunged for Killian, but it was too late. The piranhas swarmed him and disappeared into the darkness. Maddie was out of air, 115 feet underwater. Just as she was about to start really panicking, she saw Lexi swim over to her. Lexi took the breathing tube from her mouth and shared it with Maddie. Caleb, seeing what was happening, swam over and gave his tube to Lexi. They cycled the two oxygen tanks among the three of them. Maddie was furious and scared. It was like this test had been designed to be impossible. She needed to slow her breathing before they all ran out of air. Something suddenly clicked. What if staying calm was the whole point? What if the pedestal wasn't a fingerprint reader after all. Maddie swam over to the pedestal with Lexi and Caleb in tow. She passed the oxygen tube back to Caleb and reached out to the device. The other recruits gathered and watched as the red lights again formed to Maddie's palm, blinking. But Maddie began to slow her breathing. Calmer, calmer, she told herself. The seconds ticked by agonizingly as she forced her breathing to slow calmer. Her heart rate slowed, first to her normal rate, then even slower. As she entered a state of total relaxation, almost like she was meditating, the red light around her palm turned to green and the roof above them retracted. Maddie would have sighed if she had any extra air to spare. After the group safely returned to the surface, Maddie tore off her mask. Volkov watched emotionlessly and gave Maddie a single clap for her efforts. For some reason, Volkov's gaze sent a shiver down Maddie's spine. It was almost as though Volkov had wanted Maddie to fail. So it was a heart rate monitor, said Killian. A simple solution. I would have figured it out if I wasn't being swarmed by piranhas. If you don't need Maddie, then why did you steal her tank? Asked Lexi, angry on Maddie's behalf. You, you, you scoundrel, said Caleb. Survival of the fittest, Killian scoffed, taking off the last of his scuba gear and walking away. A miracle, said Sefu to himself, that none of us were eaten by piranhas. Not exactly, said Caleb. You saw their weird human-like teeth? Those weren't actually piranhas. They're red-bellied pacus. They look like piranhas, but they're vegetarian. What a relief, said Lexi. She turned to Maddie. Amazing thinking down there. You really are a genius. Maddie smiled. I couldn't have done it without you. Or you, she said to Caleb. She finished taking off her gear, then ran to hug them both. Together, she told them both, there's nothing we can't do. Wow, Maddie sounds like she's got some fast friends for life. And I'm sure as the story goes on, that each one of their abilities, their athleticism, their ability to create things or invent things, their deductive reasoning is all going to help them as they become super secret, super spies and help to save the world. Super Secret Super Spies by Max Mason. You can check it out at evpl.org, our catalog, or you can come to one of your favorite branches and check it out.
Our next book is a title you might recognize. It has been around for a while. Uh, it's one of my favorite read-alouds, one of my favorite stories, and it's a great science fiction fantasy story called The City of Ember by Jean Duprat. It's available at EVPL as an ebook, an e-audiobook, an audio CD, a playaway, and a print book. There are lots of ways to enjoy it. This book has also been adapted into a movie and also as a graphic novel. It's a great story and I hope you enjoy it. Um, the city of Ember is a very unusual city and as the story starts out, we learn a little bit about its beginnings. When the city of Ember was just built and not yet inhabited, the chief builder and the assistant builder, both of them weary, sat down to speak of the future. They must not leave the city for at least 200 years, said the chief builder, or perhaps 220. Is that long enough, asked the assistant. Oh, it should be, we can't know for sure. And when the time comes, said the assistant, how will they know what to do? We'll provide them with instructions, of course, the chief builder replied. But who will keep the instructions? Who can we trust to keep them safe and secret all that time? The mayor of the city will keep the instructions, said the chief builder. We'll put them in a box with a timed lock set to open on the proper date. And will we tell the mayor what's in the box? Asked the assistant. No, just that it's information they won't need and must not see into the box opens of its own accord. So the first mayor will pass the box to the next mayor and that went on to the next and so on down through the years, all of them keeping it secret all that time? What else can we do? Asked the chief builder. Nothing about this endeavor is certain. There may be no one left in the city by then or no safe place for them to come back to. So the first mayor of Ember was given the box and told to guard it carefully and solemnly sworn to secrecy. When she grew old and her time as mayor was up, she explained about the box to her successor, who also kept the secret carefully, as did the next mayor. Things went as planned for many years, but the seventh mayor of Ember was less honorable than the ones who'd come before him and more desperate. He was ill. He had the coughing sickness that was most com common in the city then, and he thought the box might hold a secret that would save his life. He took it from its hiding place in the basement of the gathering hall and brought it home with him, where he attacked it with a hammer. But his strength was failing by then. All he managed to do was dent the lid a little. And before he could return it to the box, before he could return the box to its official hiding place or tell his successor about it, he died. The box ended up at the back of a closet, shoved behind some old bags and bundles. There it sat, unnoticed year after year until its time arrived and the lock clicked quietly open. Chapter one, assignment day. In the city of Ember, the sky was always dark. The only light came from great flood lamps mounted on the buildings and at the top of the poles in the middle of the larger squares. When the lights were cast on, they cast a yellowish glow over the streets. People walking by threw long shadows that shortened and then stretched out again. When the lights were off, as they were between nine at night and six in the morning, the city was so dark that people might as well have been wearing blindfolds. Sometimes darkness fell in the middle of the day. The city of Ember was old and everything in it, including the power lines, was in need of repair. So now and then the lights would flicker and go out. These were terrible moments for the people of Ember. As they came to a halt in the middle of the street or stood stock still in their houses, afraid to move in the utter blackness, they were reminded of something they preferred not to think about, that someday the lights of the city might, not, might go out and never come back on. But most of the time, life proceeded as it always had. Grown people did their work and younger people, until they reached the age of 12, went to school. On the last day of their final year, which was called Assignment Day, they were given jobs to do. The graduating students occupied room eight of the Ember School. On Assignment Day of the year 241, this classroom, usually noisy at first thing in the morning, was completely silent. 
All 24 students sat upright and still at the desks they had grown too big for. They were waiting. In the last row sat a slender girl named Lena Mayfleet. She was winding a strand of her long dark hair around her finger, winding and unwinding it again and again. Sometimes she plucked at a thread on her ragged cape or bent over to pull up her socks, which were loose and tended to slide down around her ankles. One of her feet tapped the floor softly. In the second row was a boy named Dune Harrow. He sat with his shoulders hunched, his eyes squeezed shut in concentration, his hands clasped tightly together. His hair looked rumpled as if he hadn't combed it for a while. He had dark, thick eyebrows with ma which made him look serious at the best of times. And when he was anxious or angry, came together to form a straight line across his forehead. His brown corduroy jacket was so old that its ridges has, had flattened out. Both the girl and the boy were making urgent wishes. Dune's wish was very specific. He repeated it over and over again, his lips moving slightly as if he could make it come true just by saying it a thousand times. Lena was making her wish in pictures rather than in words. In her mind's eye, she saw herself running through the streets of the city in her red jacket. She made this picture as bright and as real as she could. Lena looked up and gazed around the schoolroom. She said a silent goodbye to everything that had been familiar for so long. And goodbye to their teacher, Miss Thorne, who had just finished her last day of school speech, wishing them luck in the lives they were about to begin. Now, having run out of things to say, she was standing at her desk with her frayed shawl clasped around her shoulders. And still the mayor, the guest of honor, had not arrived. Someone's foot scraped back and forth on the floor. Miss Thorne sighed. Then the door rattled open and the mayor walked in. He looked annoyed, as though they were the ones who were late. Welcome, Mayor Cole, said Miss Thorne. She held out her hand to him. The mayor made his mouth into a smile. Miss Thorne, he said, enfolding her hands. Greetings, another year. The mayor was a vast, heavy man, so big in the middle that his arms looked small and dangling. In one hand, he held a little cloth bag. He lumbered to the front of the room and faced the students. His gray, drooping face appeared to be made of something stiffer than ordinary skin. It rarely moved except for making the smile that was on it now. Young people of the highest class, said the mayor. He stopped and scanned the room for several moments. His eyes seemed to look out from far back inside his head. He nodded slowly. Assignment day now, is it? First we get our education, then we serve our city. Again his eyes moved back and forth along the rows of students, and again he nodded as if someone had confirmed what he'd said. He put the little bag on Miss Thorne's desk and rested his hand on it. What will the service be, eh? Perhaps you're wondering. He did his smile again, and his heavy cheeks folded like drapes. Something to remember, the mayor said, holding up one finger. J job you draw today is for three years. Then evaluation. Are you good at your job? Fine, you may keep it. Are you unsatisfactory? Is there a greater need elsewhere? You will be reassigned. It is extremely important, he said, jabbing his finger at the class, for all work of ember to be done, to be properly done. He picked up the bag and pulled open the drawstring. So let us begin. Simple procedure, come up one at a time, Reach into this bag, Ta take one slip of paper, read it out loud. He smiled and nodded. One by one, the students went up, chose from the bag and got their assignment. The next day, they would start their job. One by one, they go forward. After a while, it's Lena's turn. The little bag was made of faded green material, gathered at the top with a black string. Lena hesitated a moment, then put her hand inside and fingered the bits of paper. Feeling as if she were stepping off a high building, she picked one. She unfolded it. The words were written in black ink in small, careful printing. Pipeworks laborer, they said. She stared at them. 
Out loud, please, the mayor said. Pipeworks laborer, Lena said in a choked whisper. Louder, said the mayor. Pipeworks laborer, Lena said again, her voice loud and cracked. There was a sigh of sympathy from the class. Keeping her eyes on the floor, Lena went back to her desk and sat down. Pipework laborers worked below the storerooms in the deep labyrinth of tunnels that contained embers, water, and sewer pipes. They spent their days stopping up leaks and replacing pipe joints. It was wet, cold work. It could even be dangerous. A swift underground river ran through the pipeworks, and every now and then someone fell into it and was lost. People were lost occasionally in the tunnels, too, if they strayed too far. Lena stared miserably down at the desk. Almost anything could have been better than pipeworks laborer. Greenhouse helper had been her second choice. She imagined with longing the warm air and earthy smell of the greenhouse where she could have worked with Clary, the greenhouse manager, someone she'd known all her life. She would have been content as a doctor's assistant too, binding up cuts and bones. Even the street sweeper or cart puller would have been better. At least then she could have stayed above ground with space and people around her. She thought going down into the pipeworks must be like being buried alive. The last student to draw was Dune. Dune reached into the bag and took out the last scrap of paper. He paused a minute, pressing it tightly in his hand. Go on, said the mayor, read. Unfolding the paper, Dune read, messenger. He scowled, crumpled the paper and dashed it to the floor. Lena gasped, the whole class rustled in surprise. Why would anyone be angry to get the job of messenger? Bad behavior, said the mayor. His eyes bulged and his face darkened. Go to your seat immediately. Dune kicked the crumpled paper into a corner and then he stalked back to his desk and flung himself down. The mayor took a short breath and blinked furiously. Disgraceful, he said, glaring at Dune, a childish display of temper. Students should be glad to work for their city. Ember will prosper if all citizens do their best. He held up a stern finger as he said this and moved his eyes slowly from one face to the next. Suddenly, Dune spoke up. But Ember is not prospering, he cried. Everything is getting worse and worse. Silence, said the mayor. The blackouts, cried Dune. He jumped from his seat. The lights go out all the time now. And the shortages, there's shortages of everything. If no one goes, does anything about it, something terrible is going to happen. Lena listened with a pounding heart. What was wrong with Dune? Why was he so upset? He was taking things too seriously, as he always did. Miss Thorne strode to Dune and put a hand on his shoulder. Sit down now, she said quietly but Dune remained standing. The mayor glared. For a few moments, he said nothing. Then he smiled, showing a neat row of gray teeth. Miss Thorne, he said, who might this young man be? I'm Dune Harrow, said Dune. I will remember you, said the mayor. He gave Dune a long look and then turned to the class and smiled his smile again. Congratulations to all, he said. Welcome to Ember's workforce. Miss Thorne, class, thank you. And so they all have their assignments. Some are happy, some are not. Lena is miserable. She steps outside the classroom and looks around at the sky and around the city of Ember, knowing that from then on, she's going to be spending her days underground and she walks slowly home. Someone taps her on the shoulder. Will you trade with me? Dune asks. Trade? Trade jobs. I don't want to waste my time being a messenger. I want to help the city, not run around carrying gossip. Lena gaped at him. You'd rather be in the pipeworks? Electrician's helper is what I wanted, Dune said, but Chet won't trade, of course. Pipes works is second best. But why? Because the generator is in the pipe works, said Dune. Lena knew about the generator, of course. In some mysterious way, it turned the running of the river into power for the city. 
You could feel its deep rumble when you stood on Plummer Square. I need to see the generator, Dune said. I have, I have ideas about it. He thrust his hands into his pockets. So, will you trade? Yes, cried Lena. Yes, messenger is the job I wanted. And not a useless job at all, in her opinion. People couldn't be expected to trudge halfway across the city every time they wanted to communicate with someone. Messengers connected everyone to everyone else. Anyway, whether it was important or not, the job messenger just happened to be perfect for Lena. She loved to run. She could run forever. And she loved exploring every nook and cranny of the city, which was what a messenger got to do. The next day, Lena begins her new job as messenger, and she loves it. But as she travels around the city, she begins to see more and more that Dune is right. Something is wrong in the city of Ember. Something very wrong. But Lena has other problems. Something's going on at home. She lives with her granny and her baby sister Poppy. Her mom and dad have passed away. But Granny's memory is not what it used to be. One day, Lena comes home and finds Granny tearing apart the sofa, ripping out the stuffing of the cushions. She's looking for something. She keeps saying that she's looking for something that was lost and forgotten long ago. Something that her grandfather lost long ago. But she can't quite remember what it is. But the problem is, while she's looking and tearing apart things, looking for this lost something, Poppy wanders off and gets lost. Luckily, a neighbor starts to come and help Lena so that uh, someone is there to watch Granny and Poppy while Lena is out being messenger. Oh, did I happen to mention that Granny's great-grandfather was the seventh mayor of Ember? I think you have an idea now what she's looking for. Who's gonna find it? And what will it tell them? And how will it help them solve the problems of the city of Ember. That's the story, that's the puzzle. This is a great book, fun to read, gives you a lot to think about too. That's it for Chapter Book Storytime Variety Pack this week. Miss Jessica will be here next week with some more fabulous books for you to take a look at and we hope to see you next time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.